um, in the, in the context of um, um, identification and validation of biomarker, uh, this project gem uh, it's it's a rather you know ambitious project that is starting almost a year ago. Um, and, and just to put this in the context, uh, this is a, a, a pretty large e enterprise in which there are 16 partners, 14 from um, Europe to the United States, that has the ambition to follow a pretty large birth cords uh, to identify validated again biomarkers that can uh, eventually, um, you know, uh, tell us who down the road eventually on a, on a specific genetic background will develop autism with the overall major um, you know, ambition of disease interception. So in other words, to find the biomarkers that will predict who will come down uh, in developing uh, you know, this neurodevelopmental problem. Um, to put this in the context and to give a little bit of rationale of why we went this way <clears throat> and why we do this multi-omics uh, to develop this uh, you know, um, deep machine learning models, I just want to uh, just put this uh, out there that since its first description uh, in 1940, it took 40 years uh, to appreciate that there is a genetic component in autism. And, and again, from there, <clears throat> I believe that, you know, it took another couple, a couple of decades um, to really understand that genetics is important, but the environment play a major role in order to eventually develop uh, this uh, neurodevelopment problem. And, and again, uh, the amount of work that has been done ever since has been astronomically uh, you know, uh, important, but I have to say in the past five, 10 years as a, 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 an external, um, so uh, to speak, uh, you know, observer, you know, that by all means, I can't profess myself as an expert in autism other than you know, for the uh, neuroinflammatory component of it and uh, the other uh, aspect that we'll be discuss in a moment, uh, I've seen a, an explosion of science that opened really new paradigms that were inimaginable a few years ago and give us the opportunity really uh, to consider studies like GEM uh, uh, as feasible. Um, again, <clears throat> this was based on uh, the premise that the pathogenesis and a variety of conditions, chronic conditions, including autism, is indeed the results of this interplay between genes and environment. And that's the reason why the first effort that is ongoing, by the way, is really to go after the genetic component of autism. And, and this is an old, you know, slides uh, of just showing, you know, uh, a, a first attempt in trying to find the genes they are clustered in different chromosomes that can be related uh, by GWAS studies uh, to um, autism. Uh, and then of course the environment. And there've been a lot of, of, of efforts in trying to figure out which environmental factors will eventually switch somebody from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome. Um, and, and, and you know, with the premise that, you know, genes by the, in themselves with maybe a few exceptions um, are not, you know, uh, enough uh, to eventually lead to autism. And, and there is one more thing, and I believe that's really convinced the vast majority of people, that is not even a premise of autism, but it's common to many uh, non-infective chronic inflammatory diseases. So the fact that there is a, a rise in cases of autism that is really a, of, you know, uh, um, taking really the, 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 the the connotation of an epidemic. And I, again, I don't have to spend too much time on the fact that, you know, everybody knows this data uh, that, you know, in, in, in less than 40 years, we have seen a passage from one in 5,000 to one in 59 in terms of the prevalence of disease. This is puzzling, uh, given the fact that, you know, we have been working on the premise that genes plus environments are necessary sufficient to develop this problem because this is a short period of time to blame genetic, you know, um, mutations, <clears throat> you know, as, as responsible to fuel these epidemics. Um, yeah, the environment definitely changed dramatically during these 40 years, but not to the pace to uh, justify all this. So bottom line, uh, if you want to look at this phenomenon with a negative and, and pessimistic point of view, indeed, you have to conclude that we're changing the environment too fast for us to adapt. But the same phenomenon that is uh, really interpreted with a more positive and, 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 and optimistic view, it, it really teaches us another lesson. 
that the fact that we're born with genes that predispose for diseases like autism is not a destiny if, that we develop this disease that we believe before. If we do or do not, it really depends on how we play our genetic cards. And that led to a, another paradigm that had been uh, you know, validated over and over again of what it takes, bottom line, to develop these conditions, this chronic inflammatory condition, including autism. Of course, genes and environment remains, you know, extremely important, but there are at least another three elements at play that has been described that seems to really create the perfect storm, so to speak, of break intolerance and develop, uh, you know, um, you know a, a condition like, like autism. One is a, a, a barrier, particularly the gut barrier that is jeopardized. So these two words are segregated normally. Uh, so the, the internal world where we have the genes that control many of our functions, metabolic and immune functions, um, the external world where there are these elements that can instigate, you know, an immune response that leads to, uh, in case, this case, neuroinflammation, are in general separated. And if they're not, then, uh, you know, th this uh, possibility of break tolerance increases dramatically. Of course, the immune system is involved. You know, we are talking about an hyperbelligerence chronic inflammatory process, and I believe that there is little doubt now that, you know, even uh, the autistic spectrum food disorder get in the category of chronic inflammatory diseases. And last but not least, and I've been hearing, you know, throughout, you know, uh, this meeting and in the previous days, uh, the, the importance in the microbiome. Uh, and, and this really took center stage for two reasons. One, because we got tools that were not available before that gave us a full breadth of what this microbiome composition function does and can do in uh, um, specific individuals. And the second is that, you know, with the completion of the human genome, I appreciate that genetically speaking, we are rudimental. With only 20,000 genes, we can't just base on uh, one gene, one protein, one disease kind of paradigm, you know, to understand, you know, conditions that are multifactorial like autism. So definitely uh, there, there is a microbiome component that, you know, under normal physiological circumstances has a symbiotic relationship with us. But when in balance, it been, so it goes off balance in terms of composition and function, then you will eventually have epigenetic pressure against which genetic predisposition the clinical outcome. These are uh, artificially divided uh, five pillars, but they are highly, highly interconnected. Now there are animal studies and human um, you know, ev evidence, uh, and I will show you a few that clearly show that you know, an increased gut permeability impinge on the microbiome composition and function that may impinge on immune response and, and immune response can change gut permeability. And, and there's all this inter interconnection. But the key elements, the key message here is that really the composition of microbiome and its function can really push us, uh, you know, over the edge of genetic predisposition and the clinical outcome. So understanding this epigenetic pressure may lead us to some target in terms of biomarkers that can be used for early intervention for stratification population, for example, and given the fact that the autism, and this has been another concept that's been repeated over and over again, is not an homogeneous you know, condition. So stratification will be paramount to find possible treatments that can uh, be uh, you know, effective. And of course, you know, this uh, primary prevention is the holy grail of, 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 of our you know, goals. Uh, uh, so, Gut permeability, I don't, I don't have the time, nor I want to spend too much time on this because, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's been said about gut permeability over the years, particularly in the context of autism. A lot of fantasies, very few facts because there was no strong science there. But now it suffice to say that while we had no understanding of the biology and therefore the regulation of permeability of mucosa, including the gut mucosa, now we have a much better understanding with the molecular basis, how this is, you know, regulated is very clear. And 20 years ago, we uh, discover a protein that remains the only physiological modulator of permeability of barriers like the uh, gut barrier, the lung barrier, and the blood brain barrier. Uh, this molecule uh, is it's, it's a physiological modulator. Um, the gene that encodes for this zone and sits on chromosome 16, that by the way, <laughs> is one of the uh, chromosome that has the richest number of gene heats uh, that's related to autism. 
um, has been measured and found to be elevated in kids with autism, as you see in this paper here. And you know, this is not even an, 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 a comprehensive list of conditions in which it's only upregulation and therefore inappropriate increased gut, uh, gut permeability have been uh, uh, described in literature. Um, what are the cause of zone release and, and, and upregulation of this pathway that you know, um, increase antigen trafficking, therefore the chance of break intolerance develop conditions like autism? The two strongest stimuli that we've seen so far are stimuli that are related to autism. One, uh, the microbiome, because now there is a rich literature that is growing in terms of dysbiosis associated to autism. And the other one, gluten. This protein that um, is containing grains, including wheat, dry, and barley, that have been associated to possible intervention in autism to go together with the casein free diet as an effective intervention for mitigating behavior and GI symptoms that typically these kids they experience. Um, a working hypothesis that now, again, has been you know, supported by many, many uh, you know, data is this, a, a, this continuous crosstalk between the gut and the brain uh, that we thought there was a one-way discussion. So in other words, that the brain um, will communicate to the gut to change some of the function. But now we know a lot of studies, including Sarkis and many other folks, that this is a two-way discussion. And one of the things that can happen in this crosstalk is that the brain may eventually, uh, under normal circumstances, with healthy central nervous system function and normal gut physiology, maintain what is called the, the mucosal homeostasis with a good barrier, um, a, you know, good symbiotic relationship with the microbiota, and therefore a state of health. When there is a, a, a stress disease or there is other you know, issues that you know, um, uh, arises, uh, this can change the gut physiology. Um, and, and again, uh, the, the composition of the microbiome can change. There are these psychobiotics that I don't want to discuss today unless we want to expand the question and answer session. But you know, they seem to have a, 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 an impingement on uh, the brain function they can be very important in the pathogenesis of a variety of conditions, including autism. So bottom line, again, there's this crosstalk and go back and forth, contrary to what we believed before. And uh, just to, as, a, as an example, a few years ago, we published this paper in, from um, um, uh, tissue uh, um, obtained from cadavers that showed that you know, in kids with autism, uh, there is a jeopardized um, Bramber barrier that is parallel with a, a, a loss of barrier function in the GI tract. So in other words, in these kids, it looks like that both the intestinal barrier and therefore a, a, a unregulated antigen trafficking that can fuel inflammation and the blood brain barrier that also jeopardizes seems to coexist. And if you look in the literature, when we talk about the brain and gut, there are a lot of evidence in which there is this comorbidity, so to speak, because you know, kids with autism develop a lot of GI symptoms, they include diarrhea and, and abdominal pain and so on, and allergy, food additive, and so on and so forth. But you know, if you go in the literature, what is the, this comorbidity? Between nine and 91%. You say, well, what, what, are, what are range? Well, the range is because some are objective you know, symptoms and some should be reported by the, the, the patients. And, and we know how complicated when a kids, uh, for example, particularly no verbal autistic kids is not capable to, to, to really uh, express the reason of distress uh, uh, coming from the GI tract other than with uh, sign of symptoms that you can not directly correlate with uh, the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and uh, I, and uh, you know, uh, at least here, a, a series of possible signs of symptoms like abdominal pain and their infection, gastritis, and so on and so forth. So all this to say that you know we can't overlook the importance of the microbiome that you know in in in, in a condition like you know um, autism. And, and again, we had the misconception of what the relationship with bacteria we have, microorganisms in general, um, considering the microorganisms are all, always, you know, bad guys that can give us diseases like, unfortunately, we experience now with COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 experience, but actually the vast majority of microorganisms are symbiotic. So in other words, uh, folks that definitely we need uh, to have for normal biology and, and metabolic function. But when you go and look at the microbiome in the, 
Odyssey kids and you ask yourself, is this microbiome different from the microbiome uh, of normal kids? So the answer is yes. Uh, and the question is, you know, what this means? And as I told you, uh, changing the microbiome can change also the composition and the function of the immune system. And if you ask if this is associated to change of the immune system, the answer is again, yes. Because, you know, if you look at the immune cells from obviously kids, uh, they are exposed to, uh, uh, you know, a sense of in, uh, um, pathways that they can activate the innate immune response like to like receptor agonists and not agonists. They both uh, induce in autistic uh, immune cells in an exaggerated pro inflammatory cytokine response. And conversely, uh, you know, the same uh, immune cells from kids with autism, they seem to have less capability with the break uh, uh, in terms of inflammation because they produce less anti inflammatory cytokines. What is the problem of what they just said today? And, and what has been the problem in the world of microbiome multiomics to find biomarkers for patient stratification and primary prevention? That we don't know who is the chicken who's the egg. So all the state studies are correlated and not causative. So in other words, we, I can make the argument that the dysbiosis and autism is the consequence and not the cause of the disease. And here, the group of Jim Adams uh, have been really instrumental with this proof of concept microbiota transfer treatment um, to show that actually with this first study that if you treat these kids with a, a fecal transplant, uh, both the uh, GI symptoms and the behavior improve after engraftment a new microbiome that stays there for a long time. And even a follow-up data seems to suggest that engraftment is stable and improvement is uh, you know, sustained over time. And now there is an ongoing double-blind study, both in adults and kids that will eventually solidify this concept. All this to say, probably is a fair assessment that targeted microbiome is definitely, because of its epigenetic uh, capability, a, a way to go. And matter of fact, the problem, if you want to establish cause-effect relationship, there is a great advantage to go with a prospective study rather than cross-sectional because you can't establish cause-effect with a cross-sectional. So we got to go with a birth court. And here is the GEMMA overall hypothesis in which, you know, this is a gut goes in which, you know, you go from one physiology that is tightly controlled antigen traffic and then there's a break zone independent increased gap permeability with increased access of antigens that will eventually induce an inflammation. And this starts a vicious circle because this inflammation produces pro-inflammatory cytokines and make even more the intestine to um, leak until you break tolerance. And you may have, now you have a passage of a, a large amount of, of antigens that create the condition of chronic inflammatory diseases. And, you know, again, and this for autism, this inflammation materialize in the brain on a specific genetic background. Um, the, the study are divided in two large you know, subsets. One is our preclinical studies in which we use humanized mice. Um, they are transferred with tools from kids with autism or they match siblings from the same household and study in terms of behavior changes. And then a clinical study that is again, very ambitious uh, it's it's a, a birth cohort of uh, neonates at risk of autism because there is a, a sibling with uh, autism in the family uh, that will be uh, recruited and follow over time. And if they develop symptoms uh, and sign typical autism, they will start with the interventional arm with the um, use of specific pre plus probiotics to try to uh, eventually mitigate the progress of the problem. And at the same time, while we do the studies, we will validate and, and identify biomarkers that precede the onset of autism so that we can go with another arm that is a preventive arm over time. Um, all this will, 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 is based on the fact that we will acquire genome and epigenome data, metagenomics data, metabolome, proteome, and glyco, uh, you know, uh, glycome data that will eventually, uh, you know, um, based on this working hypothesis will be studies and you see each of the B here is a bio possible biomarkers that precede the onset of the clinical outcome that we want to validate to see if we can manipulate that to stop the evolution of the disease. 
Nevertheless, to say that we will generate a staggering number of metadata and, and you know, multi-omics that will be elaborated by three of the 16 uh, partners in terms of modeling of the disease with the ultimate goal that with the artificial intelligence and deep uh, machine learning, uh, probably through you know, the neural network, you know, how we eventually uh, uh, will, uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, we will eventually uh, 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 call would eventually, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, treat the autoimmune disease. I mean, the autism. This is the group of people that we have involved uh, in, in in all this, and of course, this is the the group of the MABRC uh, that has been at the heart of all these studies, and uh, together with these other folks uh, from all over the world, we are really moving forward with this very ambitious project. Thank you so much, Dr. Prasanna. That was. Uh, Fantastic. Um, very excited about Gemma and really excited to see what comes out of it. It's it's truly needed. A um, few couple questions. Uh, one, uh, has serum zonulin uh, in ASD been replicated uh, is one question. Yes. Uh, as, well, the, the one that I, 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 I mentioned was the first uh, reports in the literature from um, this group from Spain, if I remember correctly, but it's been replicated in many um, occasions. The problem with the zoning measurements is the validation of this uh, ELISA test they are on the market. There are a lot of questions about that. Again, um, some are more robust than others. So, um, and I know at least in a couple of companies, they are working on, on, on a next generation of, of the ELISA test for zoning. Okay. Uh, and do you know what percentage of children? I know it's it's open ended since you know there's problems with uh, with the the accuracy of the test. But do, you know, to your best get, guess, uh, what percent of children with ASD uh, present with elevated serum zonulin levels? So I've seen everything but between 15 and 75%. So as I, you said, you know, um, and, and again, take zoning out, but you know, also with the lactose manitol test, it's another way to, to measure gut permeability. If you do an aggregate, how many kids they have a, a, a autism that they have increased gut permeability, there is a, a fair percentage of kids. Um, once again, um, all the studies that we've done, including the one that I mentioned, um, they, they can't tell us, you know, if this is a pathogenic or the consequence. Uh, this prospective mm -hmm. study would tell us, as we saw in animals, by the way, that if the breach of, 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 of barrier function comes first, and then, you know, all the chain of events that told you Absolutely. that happened, because if that's the case, there is a, a zone inhibitor in phase three trial that will be one more things that can be done eventually in the ones that measure increased level of the zone and before the onset of the disease, that is a fair possible treatment to consider. Excellent. A um, couple other questions. Uh, one, um, you know, you guys are gonna have a ton of data uh, from Jim and as you said, it's gonna end up being a, a big data problem at the end of the day. Uh, so one question though, uh, just thinking microbiome, um, given that you know, there is some uh, evidence from uh, certain labs and preclinical animal models that there may be transgenerational extinction events that are you know, related to Western diets, uh, are, are you concerned that you know, dietary habits with the, the large you know, European consortia that's uh, taking part in the study that the diet component uh, may not generalize uh, to uh, the American uh, cohorts. And, uh, you know, just curious about your thoughts in terms of uh, diet, uh, the westernized diet, the Western diet, and, and the microbiome in relation to that, the That's our top concern, top of the list concern. And matter of fact, for that reason, we have three recruiting sites, one in, in, uh, in the United States, um, all over the states in the United States, and two in Europe, one in Ireland and another one in Italy. There are substantial difference. They're all Western, you know, lifestyle, but with substantial differences. Um, I, I hate to say, uh, but I'm assuming, and probably I'm right, that the worst, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, diet habits in, is in the United States. So <clears throat> we will eventually, yeah. and, and of course, why we are putting so much attention on diet because it's the most influential factor that can change your microbiome composition and function. Uh, and, and that's another possible 
targeted intervention, prebiotics is it's food that actually, uh, you know, these microorganisms they eat. So if we understand, you know, um, like for example, the lack of fibers being the key elements because you can't produce enough butyric acid. If we put fibers back in there, um, plus or minus a specific probiotics that we found, you know, you know, depleted in kids that eventually we develop out this, is this the way to go? Uh, or again, changing yeah. lifestyle in terms of diet, is this the way to go? I mean, these are all questions that we would love to address. Yep. Uh Another question uh, in terms of the design in a prospective study, you know, these are young kids, they're going to get sick, right? Um, so given that there is data that, you know, broad spectrum antibiotic usage may, you know, have lasting effects on the microbiome, how do you control for that uh, in this sort of study? And, and what, are the, what are the thoughts there? Well, this is an observational study. So purposely, we're not making any recommendation. We want to, <clears throat> these people to do exactly what they are, you know, they were going to do. Some people will eventually, um, you know, um, use broad spectrum antibiotics um, because of your infection or whatever. Uh, some others will be more conservative, would not do that. Um, we know the consequence of all this. As a matter of fact, the amount of metadata is staggering. We're planning to uh, really get an average of 600 metadata per child, uh, meaning that we will know mom's style before that this baby was born, uh, C-section versus vaginal delivery. How many times this guy got an infection? How many times got antibiotics? Did he got any probiotics used? There were specs in the household. There are siblings they go to daycare that can bring stuff back. I mean, all this are really tightly controlled and it's feasible because it's a birth cohort. And, 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 and of course, you know, a food diary for the first year of life. Uh, all this will be stuff that we will use, uh, by the way, and put, put public. So in other words, people that can eventually use this data for their own, you know, research and validation from other, you know, studies that eventually would not have the same study design, but can be validated through this uh, GEMMA study. So we definitely want to make this publicly available. Great. Uh, another question, uh, not necessarily related to your presentation, uh, but if you wouldn't care elaborating, uh, what's your hypothesis on the potential of phage therapy for resolving GI microbiome issues in autism? Well, it's definitely uh, sophisticated and, and um, feasible now because you can infect, you know, uh, specifically with the phage, uh, a microorganism that create the problem. Um, um, or, you know, I, I'm not too much of a fan of that, um, but, you know, with uh, some colleagues of, uh, from MIT, we're using a, a much more sophisticated approach. So in other words, using synthetic biology, um, what we like to do is, uh, is to eventually put in, once we know, in other words, what are the biomarkers that predict what's going on? Let's say I make this up that, you know, a drop of butyrate is the beginning of the chain of events that leads to uh, the problem. What we like to do is to eventually genetic engineer, put a genetic, you know, circuit in a microorganism that engraft in the gut of these kids that will be sensing the amount of butyrate in the gut. And if the amount goes below a threshold that we know that's been validated to be a alarm threshold, then it's gonna be a relay circuit that will produce butyrate from these strains that have been engrafted. I see that much better than in the phage because this is an intelligent you know, a sensor that can really do what needs to be done, if what needs to be done and when needs to be done. Um, we know that works in animals. We've never done this in humans, but that's something that, that we're seriously considering. 